Kia ora and welcome to another episode of the Mystic Discoveries podcast. I'm your host Amanda and today I'm talking to author Andrew Linnell about his book The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. Now before you think I've heard it all before, I've read the Da Vinci Code, I've read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, I know what, what he was trying to tell us. Well, maybe you don't. Andrew comes at this all from a completely different angle. Well, maybe not completely different. His sources are from pre-Christian and early Christian texts. It's just all super interesting. What was it that Leonardo da Vinci just had to put in his paintings because it was so important to humanity and yet he had to keep it hidden because, um, well, he didn't want to get burned or whatever happened to people who were here heretics back then. I won't go into actually what it was too much, except I will say, two Jesus children. Two. Two Jesus children? New concept to most of us. Um, but I, yeah, encourage you to listen to this with an open mind, because this convo gets wild and pretty esoteric. If you want to help support me to make more content like this, then you can become a patron for only for as little as a dollar eleven a month although if you want to contribute more you're welcome to um, my patreon account is patreon.com for uh, slash the mystic discoveries uh, link will be in the show notes um, if you're not in a position to support financially that's fine please can you go to my social media um, youtube channel facebook whatnot and just leave a comment on posts or share posts that you find interesting just so that other people know I exist um, leave a comment on this podcast subscribe wherever you're listening that also helps a lot and please let me know what you think and what more what what other uh, content or guests you'd like me to have on I'm all ears I want to make stuff that you want to listen to yep enjoy this podcast like I said open mind and I'll see you at the end Whakataka te ho ki te uru, whakataka ho ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a ke ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga, te he maori ora. And in English, cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south, let the breeze blow over the land, let the red-tipped dawn come, with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. Nice. And with that, I welcome you to the podcast, Andrew. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here and, and to chat with you, Amanda, and all your listeners. Yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I remember watching one of your videos on YouTube a few years ago about technology um, and I was really struck by your um, your attitude towards it all. It was very refreshing to come across somebody who wasn't driven by fear of technology, more so the how is this helping us angle, you know? Well, we'll talk about that another time, I hope. That, yeah. Yes, that's it's been very... my uh, life's work after, after retirement. Yeah, there's been a lot. So... I thought um, we could start with a short biography of you so that our listeners have context as to who you are and all that kind of thing. Then we can go into the man of the hour, Leonardo da Vinci. And then we can um, so talk a little bit about who he was and what you know of him. And then we can go into the content of your book, which is amazing, and it's called The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. So does that structure fit okay with you? Sure, that cool. sounds great. So, Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Love to. I grew up the son of an astronomy professor, mm. and of course as a baby boomer born in 
born in 1950. And I would say that in many respects, those were the idyllic years of the nuclear family. Mm. My mother, as the housewife, was the source for all social life and all gardening, both of which I learned through her. I was the middle of five kids. My youth was before television came out, so it was filled with lots of play and outdoors time. And of course, this fits into that other topic we mentioned about technology and something I I feel strongly about for children, that they need to have that play, but we won't talk about that now. (laughs) um, But, you know, I, I... As I look back, and I know others would say, my upbringing was rather sheltered and privileged. Uh, As it was a college town, the anti-war flower power movement that had swept in by the mid-60s took me up with it uh, while Mm -hmm. I was a young teenager. But in 1966, My dad had accepted a position to be head of a new astronomy department at Michigan State University. So we all moved out to Okemos, Michigan for my last two years of high school. Um, I had long hair and a closet full of bell bottles, (laughs) and that was not the style yet in Michigan. I I went through cultural shock. Um, But at the same time, it made me feel... Yeah, not only different, but sort of more advanced, because I knew they were it was coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say the orientation coming from Amherst, Massachusetts to Okemos, Michigan, Amherst had more of an emphasis and pride in education. Um, I think in Okemos, it, it, it was a different attitude towards fun in high school, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and you know, another thing, I was a decent athlete. I even played on the football team. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I was also a really good student. And so I could hang with either the nerds or the sports popular guys. Nice. <laughs> so did you... So that, that gives you a background, I guess. It's Yeah. So did you... Um, did you, you obviously went on to college after you finished high school? I did. I went to the University of Michigan Mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor, um, which was the rival school to where my dad was teaching. And um, and then after that, I went to work for IBM, where it was founded in Endicott, New York. The, uh, The largest city nearby was Binghamton, New York. Right. And then you had a career in the IT industry, is that right? That's right. I was uh, 42 years in that computer industry. Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Were you doing a whole lot of stuff? Were you programming or? Well, I was what um, was called a solutions architect. I I had uh, in my college years learned both the software and the hardware Mm. and so I was special in that regards I also had learned how to write simulation models of architectures and so on so I I was pulled into the architectural groups designing the next generation things and that allowed me to move up in my career to where I became the chief technology officer for a company. Wow, very interesting. So what took you from, well, how did you find Anthroposophy then? Well, that's that's a very fun story. Um, It's going to be way too long to tell the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But if I go back a little bit, you know, I was really moved by this cultural change that was coming through this flower power. And and I was also really saddened and moved by the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Mm. uh, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy, and and there were others too, uh, Kent State. And um, so as a senior in high school, I had founded, uh, well, at least in my heart, I thought I had founded (laughs) an organization I called the World Brotherhood Party. Mm-hmm. And I 
thought about politics. I felt that by 1984, this organization would be known and active, and by the year 2000, it was going to win the presidential election. And um, <laughs> Great, great hopes. Yeah. But, um, along this avenue, I was looking for anthroposophy, mm. uh, which people probably can figure out has something to do with the wisdom of humankind. Mm. Um, and, you know, and, and um, in working at IDM, I met a school teacher who became my girlfriend. She was practicing transcendental meditation while I was doing something called Silva Mind Control. Wow. <laughs> and, Silva uh, Mind Control. Yes. Oh, wow. Jose Silva was a, uh, an amazing individual. Anyway, mm. uh, she went on a trip to Vermont from where we were living there near Binghamton, New York. And um, on the way, she picked up a biodynamic farmer. Wow. And through him, she heard about anthroposophy. And so she dragged me kicking and screaming. I didn't want to go to a conference <laughs> on nutrition in Spring Valley, New York. Um, and I tried to prove while I was there how stupid this anthroposophy thing was. Yeah. So I went into a bookstore and picked out a book that, you know, I thought, oh, this will tell me how stupid this is. The book was called The True Nature of the Second Coming. Right. And I got to say, never before had any writer ever touched me so deeply as Rudolf Steiner did in those two lectures. And mm. I, it took me another two years or so, but I became an anthroposophist. <laughs> wow. What a tale. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love how it was just her picking up a biodynamic farmer. What are the chances? Yeah, that was, it was there's a lot more to that whole story. But, oh, yeah. Another day. <laughs> another day. Right. So, um, eventually, you've, you've obviously worked a long time um, and you're retired now, is that right? Right. Right. Well, retired. You 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 seem to be super busy, despite retirement. But so, what led you to create this book, The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance? Well, I, um, I my family um, was quite involved in academics. I was one of five kids, actually, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an older brother who had shown a great talent for art. So he got sent to summer art camps and other special programs. And so I kind of figured out as a kid that I must be the one in the family who is supposed to follow my dad's footsteps. Right. And uh, I was also very good at math and sciences, you know, but I also loved art and history. So I learned early that neither art nor history was a career path, um, but I always kept it as a hobby. And, you know, that girlfriend I mentioned before I married her eventually, um, we took sabbaticals from our jobs. I can't believe those were approved, yeah. but they were. And we went off to attend a college in Emerson, I, in, in uh, Sussex, England, called Emerson College, right, where they kind of taught um, not only the foundations for anthroposophy, but one of the professors there, he was actually also a retired professor, was named William Mann, and he offered an evening art history course, and I was really smitten by that. That was really great. Mm -hmm. So in the spring, Emerson students went off for an Italian art tour, which I also joined. And we went to Colmar, France, northern Italy, down to Florence, and then back. So we never got to Rome, but back through Milan and finally Paris. And it was in Paris at the Louvre that I first saw the Virgin of the Rocks. Mm. And so I knew there was this other version version of it at the National Gallery in London. So before I left Emerson to go back to the U.S., I made it, uh, you know, a promise to myself I would get down there. 
And that was fascinating because the way they displayed it, they wanted you to be able to walk around behind to see Leonardo's signature on the back because there was competition between the Louvre and the National Gallery as to who had the original version of the rocks. At that time, they only knew about two versions. Later, a third was discovered. And um, and it was interesting because I went around the back to see the signature. But then as I passed the side, I looked down the side of the painting, you know, right on the um, surface of the painting, yeah. you could see that there was paint on top of the varnish. Mm. And I was stunned by this. And I asked all of the uh, guides that were there if they knew anything about that. Nobody did. And I even wrote to the National Gallery asking them if they knew anything about that. And uh, the word I got back was no. Uh, nobody seemed to. And I looked in papers and everything. I couldn't find anything that described it so that fascination is what ended up leading to the book right and when did you go on that when was that expurgate uh, one more time you'll have to ask me that again when was that when did you do that when was that trip oh this was uh, uh 1978 to 79 right so this and is so... this has all been brewing for a long time right so when did you actually start writing the book? Oh, only about uh, four years ago. Ah, right. And since um, I retired, and not immediately, but soon after retirement, I decided I would, would find that you take the time to write this book. I had enough of the information, I think, to mm. make a book. But of course, as you go along, you realize you know, you really need to study a little more. Yeah, so yeah. The book took a while to come out. Oh, no, it's good. So we've heard how the book um, idea came to you or how you came across Leonardo da Vinci's work. Before we go into your actual, the actual content of the book, would you be able to share with us a basic biography of Leonardo da Vinci? I think a lot of people know who he is, but I don't know that many people know, you know, where he was born and the relationship to the Medici's and that kind of stuff? Sure. Be delighted to, um, you know, uh, Da Vinci da obviously Vinci. means um, of Vinci, the town, which was a small town near Florence. He was born in 1452, right in the middle of the 15th century. Um, and he died in the next century in, in 1519. Mm-hmm. Now, his father, like his father, was a notary and of modest wealth. And lucky for us, Leonardo was an illegitimate son of this Piero da Vinci. And as such, he could not inherit his father's business. Mm-hmm. That would go to one of his legitimate sons. Um, we know who his mother is, thanks to the work of the historian Martin Kemp, and he identifies the mother as Caterina de Mayo Lippi. Um, but it seems to have been his uh, Leonardo's grandfather, who was the one who noticed Leonardo's amazing artistic talents and thus enrolled him in a school in nearby Florence. Mm-hmm. And then um, we don't know exactly what that first school was, but we do know that when Leonardo was 14, um, his family then moved to Florence. But by this time, Leonardo was already what's called a garzone. He was a studio boy in the workshop of Andrea del Veraccio. Now, Mm -hmm. Veraccio was the most famous Florentine painter of the time. And he had this school there of which all the great Renaissance painters went through. So um, Leonardo was there amongst all these other great future painters. And there's one legend I'd love to tell you to help sort of get a feel for him. Um, 
And Ferraccio had asked Leonardo for his assistance in getting Ferraccio's painting called The Baptism of Christ Done. Mm. So young Leonardo was given the task to paint the young angels to the side and their curly hair and so on. And the work that Leonardo did was so superior to his own master's work that Ferraccio, it is said in the legend, put down his brush and never painted again. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's, it's also interesting, I, I think it's not an uncommon, but it's pretty early that uh, at the age of 20, Leonardo was admitted to the Artist Guild. This was called the Guild of St. Luke. And he was also admitted then to the libraries and gardens of San Marco. Oh, yeah. And this is where all the leading thinkers of, the, of his age, all these Florentine philosophers, this is where they hung out, to use our word today. <laughs> now, now, you also asked about his relationship to the Medici family. Yeah. And... You know, being a star pupil of Baraccio's workshop, that would have brought him to the attention of the Medici family. Now, the Medici's, of course, were essentially the rulers of the city-state of Florence. Right. And they were also great patrons of the arts. So, and of course, that's lucky for us. Mm -hmm. uh, they saved Leonardo on a number of occasions. Um, and I won't go into all of those, but um, similar to Leonardo, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, who becomes you know, the next ruler after Cosimo, his father, and then his younger brother, Giuliano, uh, Leonardo was right between them in age. And, uh, and, and then and we also know by 1480, when Leonardo was 28 years old, he was already a member of the Medici household, which means he was living there and working there in the Medici household. Right. Very interesting. The Medici's themselves are an interesting bunch and deserve their own podcast, really. They're so interesting. But, oof, oof. Aren't they? Yeah. Oh, wow. Especially since, were, were two of them popes in, in his lifetime? Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> At the time, and this I go into uh, in another book called The Uncomfortable History of Christianity, but there was a really dismal period where wealthy families got their sons to become pope. Mm. And so the, the, the Medicis would have, uh, you know, had their sons yeah. elevated to the papacy. Yeah. As you do. Well, um, would you mind describing what the political and religious climate was at the time um, that he was working alive? <laughs> yeah, this, this is really a, 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 uh, an underlying foundation to the book. Mm. And uh, it, it became... I tried to make it part of the book, and I eventually had to pull it out because the book was becoming way too huge, yeah. and I was afraid they would get the reader would get lost in all of this other background. But mm. um, as I said, so I, I put together a second book which hasn't been published yet, called "The Uncomfortable History of Christianity," but it certainly was. A, a, a big time topic, shall we say, in the uh, amongst the Florentine artists. You know, we, we know that the Black Plague had raged from roughly 1347 to 1351, and and wiped out 50. Well, some say only 30, but most say about 50 percent of the population in Europe. And we know in some cities it was up to 70 percent of the wow. population. This was really a scary plague. Mm -hmm. um, and people began asking the church, why is God doing this to us? And there had been 
by the king of France, the roundup and slaughter of the Knights Templar. And so there was a lot of feeling that the way that the church looked the other way and actually sort of colluded with King Philip of France, that this was God's retribution to bring the Black Plague. Mm -hmm. um, now, you also mentioned this sort of corruption of the papacy. Well, King Philip of France had actually moved the papacy from the Vatican to Avignon in France, where he could uh, fatten up the cardinals and keep an eye on the Pope. So he actually <laughs> had his own boyhood friend appointed as the Pope after he, and legend has it, he murdered the two previous popes. Mm. Um, so the, the cardinals were afraid of him. At one point, we had three popes. And what? If you, remember, if you know what St. Francis was trying to do to rebuild the church, we can say that St. Francis actually sort of failed in that what he tried to overcome had actually worsened. Mm -hmm. And all of this, you can see, was the groundswell that led to the Protestant Reformation, which would occur right after Leonardo had died. Right. So I would say that Leonardo knew much more than, than many historians give him credit for on this front. We know he was a great artist. We know he was a great scientist. He was a great observer. Um, so he married religion, science, and art. And he tried, I think, to keep the beauty in art and its purity. Um, but he then tried to bring these theological ideas in. And this was a great challenge for him to paint with this honesty in what he painted and depicted. Mm. So I guess this can lead us to the next question in regards to how he got this information. I mean, yeah. I, I asked the question about what kind of education he had, and particularly you mentioned the Platonic, Platonic Academy, which right. was very interesting. Could you describe that a little bit? Well, I can, and it's important to know that in 1438, there's a fascinating individual who comes to Florence named George Gamistus Plepon, mm. and, um, and this individual gave lectures while he was an envoy for the Byzantine Empire that was there seeking military assistance to help keep Constantinople in Christianity. But as many of your listeners know, there had already been the Great Schism, which divided the church in Constantinople with the church in Rome. Both sees, as they were called, excommunicated the other. Mm. Uh, and so there was no great interest in the West and the costs in sending people to help save Constantinople. Mm. Now, um, <laughs> it, it's hard to say, I'll come back to that, but, uh, you know, what did, what did Leonardo learn? You know, it's mm. supposedly in Veraggio's studio, he was just learning art. Yeah. But we also know he was admitted to all these other great institutions. And this Platonic Academy did not did not keep records. Uh, we know from some other diaries that Michelangelo was attending that. So it would make sense that Leonardo was attending this platonic academy as well mm. um, and what would be going on there well to to really get a feel for that let me just jump back to another one of these people besides Plepon who was Manuel Chrysoloris um, 
and he came to Florence also as an envoy in 1391, also gave lectures, and, um, and he talked about what happened in the fall of Baghdad, which mm -hmm. at the time, in the mid-13th century, was the most culturally advanced state in the, in the world. Right. And it was Islamic. Um, it had all sorts of universities and institutions of higher knowledge. And when the uh, Crusades had gone on, we know that many of the Crusaders came back with the, uh, some books and texts and inspirations that had flowed from Baghdad into Palestine. Um, mm. And then in 1258, a oddly Christian, but not Christianity as we know, this would be Nestorian Christians, known mm. also as the Mongols, who also swept through Russia, mm. um, and they were pagans originally, but when they came through what is today Kazakhstan, um, they, not all Mongols, but this side of of the Mongol army became Christian. And they, when they overthrew Baghdad, they absolutely destroyed the people and all the libraries full of astrology, alchemy, and other mystery knowledge. It's all of this, they completely destroyed it, throwing everything into the rivers and uh. ruining them. So that's important. But now let's go back to this George Gamistas Plethon, mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, it, about 50 years later, at the age of 83, he comes, and it's oh, wow. Cosimo de Medici and several others, including the Cardinal and all that, who sit and listen to these lectures, and it's odd, they say, is he the reincarnation? They don't use these words exactly, but this is the implication. Hmm. Is he the reincarnated Plato? Because he could speak about Plato as if he were a Plato. Right. And, and so it was because of these lectures that Cosimo de Medici asked Marsilio Pacino to become head of this, um, you know, what began small, and then Pacino builds it into this full-fledged academy. Now, there's a lot of academic debate going on uh, on this academy. It never became a university where there was accredited de degrees and so on, but it was definitely a place that you can say was similar to what the transcendentalists of Concord, Massachusetts had you know, in, in their academy, mm. um, this was a place where uh, these philosophers would come and discuss and learn together mm. and, and decide who would do what in terms of translation. So um, Plethon brought a trunk full of 82 texts that had never been seen in wow. the West. And so these texts were translated uh, by Pacino and these others. We don't know where those texts are. Many suspect that they are in the Vatican Library today. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I want to tell you and, the, and their uh, listeners is that when Plethon left after a couple of years there, he went back to the Byzantine Empire to do something quite unusual. It was to found a mystery school in the city of Mystra, M-Y-S-T-R-A, oh. Greece. Now, no one would ever take that seriously. No one would ever be allowed to do it yeah. unless that person was a legitimate initiate. Mm. Now, it's also interesting that he dies in 1452, which is the same year that Leonardo was born. 
And if you want to go back to the day Alexander was born and Herostratus throwing the burning uh, torch that took down the uh, the Temple of Delphi, yes. um, you know, uh, we can ask, was Leonardo born on the same day that Platon died? Mm. And a year later, the Byzantine Empire fell to the Ottomans. Mm. So it's it's fascinating to just see the correlation between a lot of these things. And we can't make much more than speculation, unfortunately, on these things. No, but it's good to um, be able to step back and look at the picture of what, what does it look like and just you know remove yourself from all the the facts and the all that kind of thing and just think what's the gesture of that of what happened yeah, yeah. Rega- whatever no, I, it is what, what... amanda let me mention one other thing about this guy plethon yeah yeah please um, and 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 that is that when word came back to florence that he had died and that the ottomans had taken over the empire a a group of midnight grave robbers went sailed there and dug up his grave and took it back and reinterred it in a uh, port city right next to Florence. Hmm. And so Plethon's remains are in Italy and the and there's an encryption over it in Latin that says, uh, so the great teacher may lie amongst his friends. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> or something like that. I, I may have misquoted that slightly, but it's wow. something like that. You know, why would they feel so moved yeah. to go and, you know, move his remains? Yeah, it's quite a mission and, in those days. I mean, it's a mission these yeah. days, but that would have been a lot, taken a lot of resources. Yes. It's very interesting. Um, gosh, very interesting. I can imagine, I could see this podcast going on for hours and hours, but I'd better keep us moving along, otherwise we'll, we'll talk ourselves blue. Okay, so we've kind of had a background of um, the, the environment Da Vinci uh, was living in and his um, biography. So shall we move on to talking about... Um, a big focus of your book is on the two, the, the three paintings, um, Virgin on the Rocks. And I wondered if you could explain why you and others don't think that he used the Bible as an influence for that. I mean, we might need to explain the paintings first. I don't know. I'll put the actual pictures in the show notes. But Oh, great. That yeah. would be helpful. Yes, the, the, uh, the Virgin of the Rocks, and, and as I said, there's now a third version that... Um, a uh, he's so this professor has died. Um, Pedretti was his name, P E D R E T T I, and um, he put on a show uh, in Italy in I think I have the date right, 2007, mm-hmm. and he brought out a painting that had been in private hands, so people didn't know about this third painting a virgin oh, yeah. of the rocks and interestingly it seems to be a compromise almost between the two now what is in the Louvre in Paris yeah. and most think that that one is the original the other is in the um, National Gallery in London and the one in the National Gallery as I have mentioned in the beginning of the show has paint on top of the varnish Mm. and what that is is the what's called the staff of john this would be a symbol to depict one of the children the child on the left as john the baptist and then the child on the right is considered the jesus child and then both children and the it's thought to be the Madonna in the middle, have halos only in the painting at the National Gallery, which is considered the copy. Mm. So this brings up a lot of questions about why are these different? Um, There's one other significant difference, which is the Archangel in the Louvre 
she is pointing across to the child on the left, mm -hmm. whereas in the painting in the National Gallery, her hand is down on the ground and it's not pointing. Mm -hmm. So there's a significant difference. But I would say that Leonardo is definitely using the Bible. Oh, right. But he is he using the Bible. Is not buying into the dogma of the church of his time. In fact, I think he had a great desire to ridicule the dogma of the church at the time. Mm. Um, but he is using the knowledge that he received from Chrysoloris that we talked about, and Plethon. So he is bringing into this something that he knew somehow about early Christianity, which the church had wavered and wandered far away from. Mm. And, and, and if, if what my theory about uh, what he is depicting is correct. Yeah. So, what, I mean, why, why would he bother to put himself at risk to paint um, something that would go against the church, do you think? Yeah, that's a really difficult question, a good one. You know, he was painting um, what, what called the Adoration of the Magi, mm. and he suddenly abandons this. And, and it is considered one of his greatest works. People have written many papers about the genius that they find in this unfinished work. Mm. Why would he have just got up and left it? And in the book, I tried to show that not from Plethon himself, but from someone that Plethon trained, who would have been the original leader before Pacino became head of the Platonic Academy. Mm -hmm. This would have been a very low-key, perhaps even a hidden mystery school founded by Plethon, for which Leonardo got admittance and then later an initiation. Mm. And this initiation of Leonardo, which is my assumption here, okay, yeah. um, would have then led him to realize that there is a great mystery in the birth of Jesus such that he had to abandon this painting, the adoration of the Magi, because it would not be an honest painting. And mm. so in place of that, he paints the Virgin of the Rocks. And so if its depiction were known, the Virgin of the Rocks, um, it would have been deemed heretical and it would have endangered Leonardo's life. So Leonardo spends the rest of his life then revealing this heretical mystery through his students so that none reveal enough. They all have, quote, alibi mm. that they can lean on so that nobody could accuse them of heresy. Interesting. I wonder maybe before we go into what um, you you think he, he's, and others think he's trying, he's talking about, could you tell us what the mainstream, I mean, what's the content mainstream-wise? If we went to the Louvre, what would they say we're looking at? Oh, well, the, the, uh, the painting itself, the depiction? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He, yeah. He would, so um, if you get the Louvre's brochure on it, yeah. they would say the child on the left is John the Baptist. Right. Then the next would be Mary the Madonna, mm -hmm. who has her, her right hand um, sort of embracing, uh, you know, at the on the uh, right shoulder of that child, and then her left hand would be above her child, the, as it would say, the Christ child, mm. and then behind the Christ child, holding him up or supporting him, kind of, would be this archangel who has its left hand behind the child and its right hand pointing across to the other child. Mm. Good. And then in the background, we would see 
above the child on the left, an opening in the rocks where there is a stream, and along the stream are many, many rock pillars. Mm. And behind the other child is a, or on top of, sorry, in the uh, a window in the rocks, through that window, we see just one rock pillar. Yeah. Very good. And I wondered about that for a long time. But. Yeah. Yes. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that before you maybe enlighten us with what you think it represents? Well, um, I, I think that in this disgust that Leonardo had for the dogma of the church, I think he also had it for what the populace called the Inquisition. They called them the hounds of God. Mm. And uh, the Renaissance was happening. And Leonardo, I think, saw this as a wonderful opportunity to bring science, art, and religion back together mm. with a new science and a new art. Mm. But he struggled with the church and what I would think he might call the God-abandoned religion of the time. And, and for that, I would point back to what we were talking about, about the three popes and mm -hmm. St. Francis and the plague and all these sorts of things that had people still adherence to Christianity, but losing uh, patience and, and losing reverence for the church itself. Mm, yeah, I can but see. I, I would also say that early Christianity became known through these texts that were brought back, mm. that up until that time, all the things that were considered a heresy had had their books destroyed. And, and any time a group that brought something heretical like the Cathars to Europe, they were met with, you know, in, in the Cathars case, a crusade called the Albigensian Crusade. Mm. They were wiped out in the most cruel fashion. And the Inquisition arose in order to root out their sympathizers. And so then the, the Inquisition then finds, oh, this is a good way to root out all of the heresies, yeah. such as what was dis what I think Leonardo is displaying in this, which would be that these are not John the Baptist. That's why there's no staff on the original, and that he would he through painting the baptism of Christ with his teacher Veraccio, and then later through his initiation would learn that we can't use the word Christ child yeah that that would be a Jesus child and the other one would not be John the Baptist it just doesn't make sense it would be another Jesus child and to understand that we would have to go back to and, and thank God we we now have the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. and we have some understanding of uh, from these Dead Sea Scrolls now of what some of the statements were in the Old Testament in light of these Dead Sea Scrolls, and we also have uh, the books. I pronounce it Nag Hammadi, but I think other people pronounce it differently. Mm. Um, you know the other ancient texts that have been found. And there was also existing at the time of Leonardo the Pista Sophia. So we know something about Gnostic lore. We know something about the lore of the Essenes that preceded Christianity. Um, and we also know something about the uh, Old Testament writers now that is different than we knew before. But we... Um, and, and we also know something from the Nag Hammadi about early Christianity, um, but we're, we're still lacking a lot. 
as I said, the uh, the, the so-called heretics had their books burned, and all we know about them are by the victors mm. who were rather unkind in their <laughs> uh, theological treatment of the heretics. Of course. Um, so you've just said something that might blow a lot of people's minds, and I know that it did when somebody mentioned it to me in passing a few, few years ago, about there being two Jesus children. Um, what, that, what, what, what is that? How can there be two sure. Jesus children? I mean, yeah. Can you well, unpack it, that a bit? It, it is shocking, and I will just tell you a story uh, to lean into the uh, yeah. to tell you, which is that that girlfriend of mine, mm -hmm. way way back in the beginning of our stories, one night um, I thought she was asleep, but she had uh, kept awake reading some book, and uh, I had a big day at work at IBM the next day, and she shook me and said, "You got to hear this. You got to hear this." And I go, "What?" She's reading this book about anthroposophy um, so it's a survey sort of book and she goes there weren't there wasn't just one jesus there were two jesus children mm -hmm. and so i was so upset she woke me up to tell me <laughs> and i wanted absolutely nothing to hear so when i mentioned earlier about the true nature of the second coming i picked that book up to further prove that this whole approach to Christianity was complete nonsense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so it's been a very difficult journey. I didn't mm. tell you that my ancestors came over on the Mayflower, uh -huh. and that my dad's father was a Presbyterian minister, and my uncle was, and my whole family was a long line of these. So um, this view of Christianity that I have come to through Leonardo and through this painting is is one that I know is, is indeed, it was hard for me, it's going to be hard for others. But hopefully through the work I've done, this will make it easier for others. And as I said, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Kabbalah, Old Testament books, all point to two messiahs. Mm. Now, if we think of the word messiah as a Christ being, then we're going to misunderstand. If we think of Messiah as a human being in whom the Christ could be mm. and exist, now we have the right meaning for the Messiah. They are to be human beings, and there were expected two, one kingly and one priestly. And my book lists all sorts of uh, ancient manuscripts. I can mention that uh, you will find these in books uh, such as the Damascus document, the one called Melchizedek, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs that was there. And by the way, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs also existed in Leonardo's time, right. in the 13th century, it had been translated by a Robert Grossetesti. Um, and the Testament of Simeon talks about uh, a, a priestly messiah and a kingly messiah. And so uh, the Kabbalah, the book of Zohar, talks about another messiah, the son of Joseph, will unite himself with the Messiah, the son of David, but the son of Joseph will not remain in life. He will be killed, mm -hmm. but will come again alive when the little hill receives life upon the great hill. That's, that's already in the Kabbalah, and many people say the Kabbalah was written um, as a Jewish response to Christianity and as a sort of esoteric book, um, I don't think we actually know the roots of it, but many would, uh, academians would say that it existed before the time of Christ. Mm. Uh, so uh, 
you know, and then in the Old Testament, we also have this uh, mention um, and in uh, Zechariah, we have these are the two appointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And in Numbers, there shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Mm -hmm. And then Ezekiel talks about something that I worked on for years to figure out. Um, it says, they, and these are the sticks of Judah and the stick of jo Joseph, meaning the two messiahs, shall become one in thy, thine hand. And so it points to some kind of mysterious merging of these two messiahs. And so I call these Leonardo's depiction of the two messiahs. In anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner calls them the two Jesus children. Mm. And, and you will find them in... Uh, the kingly version in the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see that Matthew talks about the three kings that come to visit. Whereas in Luke, and these are the only two stories that go to a human birth, mm. you find that the lineage is traced all the way back to Adam before the fall. Yeah. And going to the Kabbalah again, the Kabbalah would call this Adam the human archetype. The Adam Cadman was the name mm -hmm. that was given to this son of God, Adam. So we have a lot of support for two messiahs mm -hmm. in these books. And we even have, as we pointed out in the New Testament, a very different kingly Jesus in Matthew from the priestly Jesus and Luke. Mm. And you do a good job that in your book you've got um, some tables where you compare the two stories. So, well, thank you. which is a really clear picture of like, well, one of them, one of the Jesus children went to Egypt and the other one didn't, or it doesn't get talked about in the other one. Um, right. Uh, yeah, if I might, I, I think it's hard for people today to really get a sense of what was meant by kingly and priestly yeah because we we today we think you know all people are born equal and you know they're going to grow up to whatever they're like we've lost already the sense that if you're born the son of a notary you're going to grow up a notary yeah if you're born the son of a shoemaker you're going to grow up a shoemaker you know and if yeah. you're born the son of a king well, if you kill off all your other brothers, you're going to grow up to be a king. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, and it, the same thing in the priest. The priestly lineage was the Levites in, in Jewish traditions. Um, mm. You know, and so it's interesting that in the Luke lineage of the two sons of David, I mean, he had more, but two are mentioned in Luke. Um, it's mentioned that He's through the through Nathan, who was the high priest, and yet in Matthew we go through David, but through the king Solomon. Yeah. So it's very very different, very interesting to try to follow that. And I wonder, and in the book, as you probably know, I pose the question: Are we looking back, in a sense, all the way to the fratricide? of Cain and Abel. Yeah. And so one of the questions that always comes up, and it should be in the minds of all your listeners, is what happened to these two boys, these two Jesus children? Mm -hmm. What and, did happen? And so, pardon? Yeah, what did happen? Yeah, so <laughs> um, we don't have much to go on except in Luke. So it, it, it's been well documented that the, the story of Jesus in Matthew seems to point to an earlier birth because in the story in Luke, 
Herod seems to be already dead. There's no slaughter of the innocents. They don't have to run away to Egypt. There's none of that in Luke's story. And so when Luke has his Jesus reach the age of 12, the family goes from Passover to Jerusalem. And then on the way back, they notice, oh, my God, Jesus. Well, that's a funny thing to say. Oh, my God, Jesus (laughs) isn't with us. And so they race back. And interestingly, it says for three and a half days, they're looking for him. And they finally find him, and they're shocked. He's in the temple. And so this scene in the temple is what Pinterichio, one of Leonardo's students, uses to help reveal this mystery. Mm. He paints that scene. And, and I go into an analysis of that in the book, and I have to go on time here, but... Um, it would mean that the, the uh, Jesus of Matthew was the older one. We don't know exactly, maybe 14, maybe 15. Mm-hmm. And so that older one would have given to this Luke Jesus his earthly wisdom. He would have been of this lineage that begins with Abraham in in terms of physical lineage, but we would have to trace him back to this earthly wisdom, which would go back to the ancient Zarathustra, who, you know, later his his um, mystery school uh, is led by Zoroaster, mm-hmm. and many have surmised that the Magi, the three Magi, were all Zoroastrian. Ah. followers and so they knew about the astrology and could read about the birth of this Zarathustra this high being um, in the stars and so that now I just said of the stars but that's actually from the earth that we see it Mm. and so that's an earthly wisdom that would be carried by this Matthew Jesus and um, and when would have been given to the Luke Jesus, and because of that, the Matthew Jesus afterwards would now be, and I'm going to use this word from anthroposophy, ego, or its I am-ness, would have been moved also to this Luke Jesus. And so this Matthew Jesus, without that, would die, and that, according to Riddlestein, would happen in a couple months after this scene in at the um, at the temple and now we still don't have christ born no no we don't so at this point at this point we just have jesus of nazareth yeah so at that temple scene when um they come back mary and joseph come back and they say they're astonished by the wisdom of their son that's you cut you kind of speculate in your book that maybe there was some sort of mystery rite that happened in order for the the boys to kind of exchange those higher or put the higher bodies from one into the right. other yes exactly mm-hmm. um, and I'll point to the raising of Lazarus mm. as an example um, and what used to happen before Lazarus is that a person that was to be initiated was placed in a state where to all of those who were not initiated, who could not see their higher spiritual entities, would say that person is dead. Mm. They would see them as dead because their life body, their chi or their prana had left the body was Mm. outside the body and so the body would be already beginning to decay to smell bad and so it was kept in a sacred space behind the curtain in the holy of the holies and the hierophant would be watching over this and the longest they could take them would be this three and a half days that the parents were away Mm. and and now looking for their child 
And so the hierophant is responsible for calling back the spiritual entities to re-enter the body. But now the spiritual entities that are so called back by calling the I am of Jesus back, it's now a slightly different spiritual entity that re-enters that. Mm -hmm. And for this, I, I have to uh, turn to Rudolf Steiner to sort of give my proof. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that kind of spiritual capacity to see that, but yeah. um, Steiner did, and this is one of the great gifts that Steiner gave. Um, and you can see that Leonardo knew this, though, mm -hmm. by what he had his students paint. Mm. And as I say, Pinturicchio is one of the greatest of these in his Christ amongst the doctors is how it's titled. I like to use Jesus amongst the doctors because I don't put the birth of Jesus onto the earth until the baptism. Mm. Could you could you describe what you mean by that? How Because everybody knows, well, everybody's probably heard of the Christ child. But why do you think that the Christ child isn't an appropriate way to describe it? Right. Well, at this point, we're talking about the Messiah as a human being mm. and, and as two Messiahs that need to get merged into one in thine hand, um, as it says in Ezekiel, um, chapter 37. Um, so... Uh, what I find then is that we have the preparation for the vehicle mm. and then at the baptism, the early Christian version read, today I have beget thee. That has been changed in later versions in the third century rewrote that passage. You can find academics arguing about that, but they've pretty much all come to that conclusion that the early versions are the ones that say, today I have beget thee. Mm -hmm. And what that would mean then is that today the Christ is born into a human body, but it would not take full penetration. It would not have its cosmic hour come until the Last Supper. Mm. And that would be the time then that he would say, my hour has now come, and he can now go through death. Mm. Go through death. Yeah, that, and um, that's a whole thing in itself, what that mystery of Golgotha was. But to keep, um, to bring it back to the two Jesus children, um, and Leonardo da Vinci and I think there's something really um, poignant in what's behind the two Jesus children to help people get a picture of what um, the difference was between the two of them um, and so you talked about some um, behind one uh, one Jesus child there's a stream and there are lots of rocks and then behind the other one there's just one big rock would you mind explaining why that um, is a clue or what it describes yeah um, if you if you go to the stories of these two being one the matthew jesus and one the luke jesus you would see that behind this matthew jesus is this window as i call it in the rocks where behind it you see the river and we might even call it um, the River Styx, S-T-Y-X, mm. that is the river of forgetfulness, where we forget our past lives. And behind, so along the banks of this river are lots of rock pillars, which I say in the book are indicative of the past lives of this child. And rocks because it's this earthly wisdom that uh -huh. it has garnered. 
behind the other one and raised up much higher is another window through which we don't see the river of life. We only see one pillar, mm. which would represent the life of Adam before the fall, which would be in Eden, which was not earthly yet. Mm. And that this child then is having its first earthly incarnation. Mm. And so it brings with it no karma, only purity. And I think Leonardo would have found this when he discovered it essential for the future of Christianity to come to understand all of what I just mentioned, but especially the purity that this child is the representative of humanity before the fall. Mm. Yeah. But then we have something other that comes, which is the fratricide in the Cain and Abel story. And so in a strange way, I also see that the Matthew Jesus is a representative of the Cain. And so he will sacrifice his life to enter the body of the Luke Jesus in the temple when they're behind the curtain mm -hmm. in the Holy of Holies. So he will sacrifice his life as a karmic, retro, uh, you know, karmic repayment, so to speak, uh, uh, a reparation of the fratricide. That he committed at the beginning of time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In, in this sort of transition time between Eden, which I would say was not an earthly occurrence, to when the lineages of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel had finally become gender-specific and physical. Yeah, you have a good um, chapter on, uh, a good section in your book about that, about the Seth line and the Cain and Abel line and what the androgyny factor was and it's a really good explanation of this kind of principle I guess you could say right. well, um, thank you. yeah no it's good it's a nice um I must say just in general the book is a nice accompaniment to if you're reading Steiner's version well Steiner's words on it on this whole topic which is quite um quite heavy and dense right. and can be quite difficult to work through it's nice to have books like yours which um yeah bring a more accessible picture to these things i guess yeah i'll just say that <laughs> in the middle of the so interview Amanda, yeah Amanda, it, it might be um just to help out a little bit more to say how was this knowledge of two messiahs lost and, and um, I, I, as I said, my second book will go into this more, but I touch on it a little bit, which is that um, a very important council occurred in the fourth century. Mm. And as we know, Constantine had become emperor of the Roman Empire, and he moved the center of that empire from Rome to his new city named after him, Constantinople. And his mother was already a Christian. So he allows her to lead an expedition to the Holy Land where she discovers the tomb of Christ. And so he gives her money to build um, the Holy Sepulchre, the first one. And then he... Um, but he's, as a politician, knows that um, he's got to get the bickering done and get all these different Christianities. And I put it that way, um, and there's many other scholars that call it multiple Christianities of the time, to agree on their theology. It, it, it must have been very hard to rule them because if he favored one, the others would all get upset. Yeah. So 
uh, as a politician he knew. So he said, okay, I'm calling you all together. Come send your representatives and we're going to work it all out. And so he uh, gets this Nicene Council to be held and they had to decide what rules to use. Well, of course, as part of the Roman Empire, they're going to use the rules of the Roman Senate. Yeah. Majority wins. It, I think, was the first time majority would decide a theological issue. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it caused for all sorts of splits in the Christian church because the losing side couldn't agree on what the winning side had. So either they had to allow themselves to be excommunicated uh, and that all of their records and so on were destroyed, or they exiled themselves as the Nestorians did. Mm. So we, <laughs> and that's another big topic is, is all of Nestorian Christianity, which at one point was much larger than Roman Christianity. Mm. Well, I mean, why would why would the Romans or the church feel that the two Jesus children was not, why did they scrub that out, so to speak? Well, that's, that is fascinating. And, um, and, and it's hard to fully answer that except to say that Christianity fully, under Constantine, fully embraced should we call it Romanism? Romanism in its practices and its rules. Um, it retained a lot of mystery. So, for example, the selection of a pope, and when the pope is selected, then he changes his name, mm. like Saul did when he went through his initiation and became Paul mm. or Lazarus when he went through his initiation and changed his name to Paul mm. after being Saul. Um, so uh, we, we have these things, but materialism was well entrenched already or century. The ancient mysteries were totally gone. Mobs had been um, encouraged to go tear them down as something that was old and that Christianity had replaced. Right. Um, paganism was considered the antithesis. And one of the uh, Roman rulers uh, tried to take Rome back to paganism, and he was murdered by his own Christian soldiers in Persia. Huh. Um, there's lots and lots of these stories, but it would seem that Rome was very interested in one's birthrights. And, um, and so the sense of Romanism prevailed into this with materialism that the idea of a cosmic Christ coming at baptism just didn't make sense anymore. Mm. And so they, they um, eventually called that a heresy and took it out of their Christianity, even though the early Christians had bought into that idea. Was it partly to do with the fact that they didn't um, want the reincarnation? Uh, they didn't want people thinking about reincarnation anymore? I, I would think that would be one of them. I can't really get to proving that, yeah. but um, we do see as this materialism grows from about the 5th century B.C. through this 5th century A.D., that um, the knowledge of reincarnation is essentially exterminated. And mm -hmm. I think it's not just the church, but I think it's because it no longer was something that people, even those who might have gone through some kind of initiation, could reach to. They could not reach to their past lives anymore. So all they could do would read about it in Plato's works or mm -hmm. something of this nature or some of the earlier philosophers. 
So I think you're correct that that with if they could still hold on to reincarnation, then this idea of something coming in the stream in, as the two Jesus children would have made more sense, or the two messiahs. Mm. And then this grasping of Christ being born at the baptism would have made much more sense. But but Christian Gnosticism was sort of the proponents of this cosmic Christ. And they had trouble even understanding what happened on Golgotha. Mm. So the early Christian debates were, did the cosmic Christ leave the human Christ on the cross? Is that why he said, I've been forsaken. You know, he doesn't say I've been for you know, but why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And um, and and so the Gnostics were saying, well, see, you know, he was forsaken, and and um, and the cosmic Christ left him. And whereas uh, the those who were saying no, Christ became a human at that point would have. And so moving forward, we would say, well. Christ came at birth and he was human through the whole thing. Mm. And then we get these stories that appeared in the fourth and fifth century, um, which never became part of the of the Bible, thank goodness. Mm. Um, you know, telling stories of young Jesus doing miracles of turning clay pigeons into real pigeons and so on. All right. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there would have been a lot of that stuff around. Um, and I guess like a lot of it, uh, they the church also removed uh, spirit from uh, the picture of the human being. So it was just body and soul. And so that might have had something to do with uh, changing the narrative somewhat, would you think? Right. And we know that Paul speaks about the human being as being soma, psyche, and pneuma, body, soul, and spirit. Mm. This would have been... Um, and I, I'm sure it was a theological question that many in Leonardo's time were asking. Mm. And what in that Eighth Ecumenical Council was decreed was that the human is only body and soul and that he doesn't have any second soul. Mm. It implies, but it actually doesn't actually say the word statedly that he doesn't have spirit. It just ignores spirit altogether. Yeah. It just says the human's only body and soul. And I'm sure that disturbed Leonardo. And and, um, and so in his attempt to sort of mock the church um, and its dogma, um, which we see in his painting of John the Baptist, that he's mocking the church because he's using the very person the church couldn't stand his I don't know, people call him his pupil it was never his pupil although he taught him art it was his wayward kid that he took under his wings uh -huh. who was just incorrigible was always stealing and so on even from his his real pupils was he would steal paint brushes and paints and do practical jobs that they didn't appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> but but Leonardo absolutely loved this kid. Mm -hmm. Salai was his name. Right. And, and he was such an imp. That's so funny. So he was admired that he could deal with this kid. But mm -hmm. um, and then there's all sorts of theories that come later that you know, did Leonardo accidentally kill Salai? And I don't buy mm -hmm. him, but there's all sorts of other theories that have been recently conjectured out there. I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of um, stories about him around. Um, right. So, I mean, I feel like, like I said before, we could talk about this for a long time, but I think maybe for today we're kind of coming to the end of a little introduction to your your book um and this whole idea of the two jesus children and that kind of thing is there anything else you feel we've missed that you want to mention before 
we round this off? Well, the um, I, I will just mention real briefly the Pistis Sophia. Yes. Has this passage where in chapters 59 through 62, it's talking about two Marys. And it's talking about a physical Jesus and a spiritual Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, it's called, they're called brothers in this um, passage. And because Leonardo um, and was found in a park with other young men his age, and they were naked, it was assumed that they were engaged in sodomy. Mm. Um, and because... Um, Leonardo standing with the Medici as well as one of the other boys or young men um, they the charges were dropped mm -hmm. but it's noted and of course many people have wondered was Leonardo gay mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know and I'll just let that debate rage I'm, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't I don't think it matters but no. I don't think anybody can say one way or the other. He paints some incredibly sexual paintings of a woman uh, later on mm -hmm. that um, I, I think would uh, be very difficult if he were gay to paint it in the way he did. But, mm -hmm. um, but in any case, if he painted that scene from Pista Sophia of 12, 14, 15-year-old boys kissing, as it says in there, mm. then I think um, it would have drawn up all of these uh, Allegations? rumors of Leonardo yeah. again. Yeah. And so he paints young boys of the same age that are in his Virgin of the Rocks kissing. And his students pick that up. And it's fascinating to compare the whole series of the uh, Flemish painters who came to his studio in Milan to learn, and then they take back this um, holy infants embracing theme Mm. there as well as a number of his students picking that up and that carries into one of the most amazing paintings that uh, showed up in this Pedretti's uh, exhibition and that's by Bernardino de Conti mm. and that one shows the two children like we see in Virgin of the Rocks but to prove that the one on the left is not John the Baptist, he paints John the Baptist in the middle between the two of them. Ah, clever. So. Well, I like that you mentioned in the book, too, the reason that um, he chose to paint uh, toddlers as well, as well as that, is also because they, you said they're close to that, like, cosmic innocence, but they can still stand on the ground? Am I right? Right. Mm -hmm. The cosmic innocence also would uh, take away any of this sort of adolescent sexuality. Yeah. He didn't want that to be considered. Because it wasn't, it's not a sexual thing. It's a, it's a representation right. of a higher uh, impulse or higher activity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very good. Wow. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. I wonder if um, you could you could mention if uh, you could mention which of like Steiner's lectures or books people might want to read, as well as your book, of course. But is there particular le le lecture series that you think are good for people to? Well, I won't mention many, but I will mention for the two Jesus children. Um, the books are called According to Luke and According to Matthew. Those are two different books. Mm. Or 
the older publications used the uh, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew. Mm. Um, those discuss it as um, as well as a book called the Fifth Gospel. Mm. These are all wonderful to read, but his foundational book to all of this is called Christianity as a Mystical Fact. So these others that I mentioned were lectures that he gave, but Christianity as a Mystical Fact is a book he wrote, so mm. it's fundamental. Yeah. And, and one more that I think is just wonderful for all of this um, is called The Festivals and Their Meaning. Mm. And that, of course, was lots that go more deeper into the mystery of Golgotha and the mysteries of Christianity. But I think that's enough to get people started. and yeah. uh, they'll, they'll get a lot out of those. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, so where can people, can you tell us about what projects you're doing at the moment and where people can buy your book and connect with what you're up to? Well, the, the book, The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance, Leonardo, is being offered right now just by Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a story behind all of that, too. Um, what I founded soon after retirement from the computer field is an organization called Mystech, M-Y-S, capital T-E-C-H, for the Mysteries of Technology. Mm. And what we are trying to do in this is to build out of an understanding of the human being as soma, psyche, and pneuma, how a moral impulse from a human being will be able to go through our spiritual entities all the way into a machine where the machine will then perform that operation on our behalf. Wow. So it's, in the words of Rudolf Steiner, it's called a mechanical occultism. And it requires the utmost in selfishness which I haven't attained yet, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> which is why I think this organization isn't there yet. But mm. in the meantime, we get asked all sorts of questions from people who are just so full of fear about where technology is going that um, part of our work right now is an education on human destiny, shall we say, and how to face our future without fear. Mm. So it's a lot of education um, and, and a development of what Steiner called a spiritual science. Mm. And do you have, there's a website for that or a Facebook group? Uh, well, I put my lectures up on, so there's a couple. There's um, a a website called mystech.co, just C-O, not com, mm -hmm. where I put my lectures up there for free on this subject. And then um, there's another one called mystech.org, which will become the landing page for everything to do with mystech, but it's still a little bit under construction. Mm -hmm. um, but the things like events like the lecture. I'm giving a lecture uh, this Friday evening on what we've been talking about. So on the book, I'm giving a lecture. Um, and so those sorts of events and the events with technology are also listed there on the mystech.org. Right. And we also founded something for people who love social media but don't want to be tracked and have their data harvested and sold. Hmm. We founded our own social media called social.mistech.org. And hmm. so people can go there and, and uh, you know, get off of Facebook. Right. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, but oh well. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> you can be, yeah, that sounds great. I didn't realize you've done that. That's cool. I'll go join. It's a lot of, it's been a lot of work. So we're trying to lead a, a, a 
a sort of avant-garde, if you will, of how technology can remain humane. Yeah, that's important work to be doing. We think so. Yeah. Someone's got to do Thanks it. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no, it's great. Well, um, I'll let you get on with your afternoon and I'll go have a morning. Um, but before we go, I'll just close with a verse, if that's okay. Yes. Yes. Right. right. So I'll say it in Māori first and then I'll say it in English. This is a different one. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ponamu te moana. Hei haurahi mā tato i te rangi nei. Aroha hatu, aroha mai, tato ai e, tato katoa, hui e, taiki e. May peace be widespread, may the sea be like greenstone, a pathway for us all this day. Let us show respect for each other, for one another, bind us all together. And thank I'm you. I'm going to have to ask you for those. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, they're um they're just uh, they're traditional Maori karakia, so I will send them to you for sure. They're thank beautiful. You. Um, thank you again, Andrew. Oh, you're very welcome, Amanda, and uh, goodbye for now, and yeah, goodbye yeah. to all your listeners. Thank you so much. Wowza! That was a chat. Again, so grateful um, that Andrew uh, spent an hour and a half with me today talking about his book. Really looking forward to hearing more um, from him um, and actually really interested in his work around the field of technology. I appreciate his attitude, which is very much not one fear-based, but one of like, well, technology is coming. It's becoming more integrated into human life. How can we imbue it with our humanity? as opposed to being lost in our fear of technology and um, just either avoiding it or losing ourselves within it. Um, yeah, go check out his pages, follow, like, subscribe to mine, and I will talk to you again in the, ne in the near future. Kaki te anō. Go well.